Hi, I'm Resham Arden and this is the Now I Know podcast. This wellbeing podcast is all about breaking the stigma about mental health and especially getting men to speak up more to get the support they need. With me today is Shravan Alopi, who you may remember from episode two, where he spoke about mental health in the army, how he got himself out of the world of gaming and into the world of being a wellbeing therapist. Today's episode is called Now I Know About Men's Mental Health and Struggle with Today's Society. The main topic of today will be the reasons why men are experiencing anxiety, and we hope we can give the audience some tools to manage their mental fitness. Welcome, Shravan. Uh, thank you, Rush. Nice to have me back. You're welcome. So to those listening, this is actually a take two of a of a podcast we did a few weeks ago. Yeah. And we had a few tech issues and we couldn't do it. So we've decided to still go ahead, but we're doing it virtually. So those people starting out on a podcast, it doesn't always go as we planned. So this is a take two. So we hope you guys mm-hmm. enjoy today's episode. Um, so Shravan, um, I know you have a lot of clients as your wellbeing therapist. Yeah. So from the clients you see, what experiences are men having with anxiety? So there's um there's like an ever growing sort of it, it seems like there's an ever growing like I, I I'd even call it like an epidemic really within young men. Um a lot a lot of the anxiety is to do with just the uncertainty in life. Um specifically with men. I think a lot of the guys one, there's a there's a big stigma around men's mental health and how they don't really like to talk about their their issues and what they're going through. And because of the boom and like social media the digital age where there are also you know there are also certain like political views which are very uh, extreme that also adds on to the pressure because now men don't really know sort of who they sort of align with and um you've got say one person saying like, you know if you're not um like this this like iron wall stoic uh, just man's man then you're not a man and then you've got another person who'll be saying, well, you know, if you don't open up about your feelings, well, then, you know, that's also showing that you're a wounded, you know, wounded man, there's wounded masculinity. There's a lot of intrinsic masculinity issues that a lot of guys are, are dealing with. But then on top of that, it's also with, you know, the, the come up of, say, like, for example, the, our female counterparts who are a lot more self-sufficient. So they don't really need the typical male provider role in their life anymore. A lot of the men that I work with are saying that they struggle with that. You know, I have a have a few clients who who are, you know, dads in their in their thirties, and they're saying that you know things have changed to the point where now they feel as though they don't they don't really know what else to give to their to their families because they were always the provider. So that's one issue. Another issue is also the I would say the generational issues that have been passed down. So for myself, I'm from the millennial generation. I just about managed to get into the millennial gen. And as I was growing up, you know, it, I, I, I saw my, a lot of my peers just being very sort of like stiff upper lip as guys. Like we don't talk about our issues. You know, we just kind of put our heads down and grind and that's it. And what I'm seeing with like the younger generation now is they're a lot more like liberal with their feelings that there's a lot more um there's a lot more being promoted to to talk about feelings and express that and now we're in this melting pot of not really knowing like what is the right way so i think there's just a lot of confusion based around that and it's fundamentally down to almost losing or having a lack of purpose yeah purpose wow i mean you've mentioned lots of generations there i know like you know <laughs> the generation of men's from my from my dad's generation to my brother to now my son you're right it's so different so like you know our parents didn't really open up especially the men didn't really talk about anything um my generation i think it's slowly picking up like them you know, they're learning they're growing um and i think for my son's generation my son's nine i really want him to, i see he already opens up because we're encouraging it we're talking about it at schools and in the workplace and on tv um so in terms of the next generation you know how is anxiety affecting today's children particularly particularly about trauma um you know childhood trauma and that sort of generational trauma so i have i have a few younger clients in the age, ages from well, one is as as young as four, and I've also got a few like teenage young men coming to me, and um, 
with regards to trauma, I, I, I would say within the Asian men, they they have this, um, they have the the whole you know your, your parents are very hard on you and they want you to to excel and you know just focus on your studies and you have to get high grades otherwise you won't really cut it in today's society or just won't cut it as a as a successful individual and what's causing the clash there because that's already a big stressor that they're dealing with what's causing the clash is also with what they're being told on social media and what they're seeing you know nowadays i think the the most popular job role out there for the younger generation is to be an influencer everybody wants to be a youtuber or they want to be some sort of um, instagram personality or tiktoker which look by by all means is is fine the the problem there is that there's a great deal of comparison taking place and uh, a lot of the kids are you know almost jumping to bandwagons and so they're not really listening to their to their to like their their true inner selves or their higher selves as, as i will talk as i talk about it they they find that it's um it's it's very much a case of feeling the need to sort of fall in line with a with a certain movement because it's perceived to be cool and that's that's quite normal within young kids but what that's doing is it's masking over the traumas that they are not facing that they're not dealing with you know from the home environment and then also what they pick up through their peers and it's just being sort of blanketed with this need to fulfill a role and there's no real sort of drive behind it so with regards to the anxiety that they feel it's a lot to do with performance driven and it's it's performance as you know um a, a young man because now the the identity of a male has just been so sort of like dulled out. It's almost been grayed out. There's no real picture, a persona, a role. One thing I will say is also in in today's society, with the rise of single mothers, you know, a, a lot of the guys are growing up without a male role model or a real, or a male figure, and that for them is also quite it. it it's quite confusing because again. You've got social media now telling them, well, this is how you act as a guy. That's come from one person. There's no real credibility. It's just whoever's got the most following. So they'll just flock to that. That feeds into the trauma of, I don't understand, you know, who's my, who's, who's my support system here. I don't understand myself. And it just leads into this self sort of this, like this, uh, the self prophesizing feedback loop of just chaos and confusion. And then, I, I I also see a lot of the the performance to like the human performance to find identity also clashes with this perceived idea of I need to be like a high achiever and just be uh, an academic specifically within like the young Asian man that I that I see and um, I've got one guy who's who's starting to be a doctor but he just cannot focus because he's just always anxious all the time. Oh wow, it's a lot. It's a lot to take in, isn't it? With all the different mixed messaging, like you say, it's the, like you say, the the lack of purpose and the confusion, which yeah. is what you're probably seeing a lot with your clients. Um, and you you've touched on social media, but you know, if you're getting clients coming to you, and you know that social media is playing a part, you know, how do you, um, you know, my, my next question was going to be how is social media affecting anxiety in our children? You know, you've touched on that, but what what sort of, what would you say to them, especially like the teenagers that are coming to you? Yeah, so so the first thing I say is first of all, if you if you find like say you, you say you take an influencer, right, and you you find them to be appealing, well then I ask them what about them is so appealing, right? Look at um yes, yeah, so you look at like the physical value, you look at the following, you see like the audience, the people that are hyping them up, but then look further beyond that and that's that's where i try to i try to keep things as value based as possible i try to get them to identify the values in the person that they are that they are being inspired by and then connect that to their own values and one thing that i've learned is a lot of the a lot of the the, the kids who who are like chronically online as i call it they live their lives online their values tend to change depending on the influencer that they that they are following, right? So there's nothing you know hard or 
or um, or solidified within themselves, they're just almost like shape shifting, and so that within itself is is a big is a big problem because if you don't have a set of values or if you don't have a set of principles that you live by, you will just be very wishy washy and in the wind. So that's the first thing that I I, I work with them to identify and and figure out. The second part to social media is I get them to look at once they've identified the values that they're looking for, we'll then start consuming content that actually falls in line with that. Right. Because in my, in my own theory, I'm a very big believer of, you know, you are the average of your five friends that you talk to. Well, now that's a more common phrase is you're the average of the five creators that you consume because we're all online. Even the workspace is online. So I, I get them to really look at, the type of content that's available out there. And because the internet is such a ever expanding universe, you'll find literally anything for there's, there's something for everyone. Right. And when you have something that, you know, it isn't so tangible, you can just quickly just access it from so many different databases. It's very easy to just digest and absorb stuff. And then if you don't have something that, you know, fall sort of like fall back on, like, okay, does this, does this fall in line with my values? You know, is this something that I actually want to work towards achieving? Is this something that I truly agree with? Is this a part of my identity? Then it becomes almost like you're just taking, you know, you're just sort of taking something from, from everyone's pot. So I get them to then start reframing it by looking at the type of people that they want to aspire to be. And make that a part of their own identity rather than trying to grow into becoming the influencer or trying to become the other person. That's, that's the advice that I give them primarily. Absolutely. Well, it's great to have you as a, a great role model, someone to <laughs> relate to, someone to teach them, because I think having you as a younger person as well, they probably listen to you more than they probably listen to like the, the older generation. You know, um, and I'm, I'm speaking about role models. I know you mentioned about single parents and, you know, having role models. Um, I'm a single mom myself and something I'm really, uh, you know, strive for is having great role models around my children. So even, you know, for my son, you know, a great role model is their PE teacher, their granddad, their uncle, you know, friends and 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 things like that. So I think role models don't all and that's just it, you know, like having that place. It's like role models could be anybody for your children, yeah. not just the immediate parents. Um, so that's some advice I'd give to a lot of single parents out there. Like, you know, if you don't have a role model for your children, there are so many more people in your community that can be those role models. And I think that's so important for our kids to look up to. Um, so what tips can we give our audience to manage their anxiety? Like, so, you know, if I was a client of yours and I was having anxiety, what would you teach me? So the first thing that I, I say is with, with anxiety, it, it stems from an emotional or there's, there's some imbalance which is triggering the the feeling of anxiety. It's just the anxiety is is like you've you've lost the ability to to cope. Right? You you you've become overwhelmed by whatever it is that is that is troubling you. So then I look at okay, if you can't control the feeling coming coming to you, coming to the forefront of your mind, what you can control is whether you react or you respond to that, and. The easiest way, the easiest way that I found to help sort of curb that is by doing a breathing technique. And I call this the square breathing exercise. So essentially, imagine like you're creating a box with your breath. And this is all through um, nasal breathing. You breathe in for five seconds, hold the breath for five seconds, release the breath for five seconds, and hold the breath out for five seconds. And if you if you repeat that for a cycle of three times, what you'll find is you take the thoughts away from the feeling of, oh, I'm being overwhelmed or I'm feeling anxious. And it's now being overridden by just focusing on the breath, right? Because you're breathing in such a way that your body is now forced to actually put conscious thought onto your breathing patterns and onto the breath work. And so that's the first step to, to managing the anxiety. It's about bringing yourself back to a neutral position and then moving up from there. So then the next stage of that would be to then identify what it is that is causing your, 
your anxiety. Now that you've you've lived through a few episodes, you now have a um, a tool to sort of put a pin in it and and short circuit that process. We can then revisit what it is that's causing the anxious feelings, right? And then I I say the first thing to do is to write it all down on paper, because thoughts in our heads that stay on our heads become like a whirlwind of different different things, right? And then it just becomes a bit messy. But when you write something down, the hand-eye coordination movement to jotting thoughts down to paper, it then starts to like materialize and becomes very real. It's it's tangible, right? You want to create something that you can interact with. Because with thoughts, I mean, I could literally be thinking about, oh, this is this is making me feel weird. And then in the next door, I'm thinking, oh yeah, well, I need to go to the gym now. And while, yes, I've done something that helps me sort of deal with the feeling of, you know, not feeling so great. I've not actually addressed the problem because I can't physically see it. When we write it down, you've got something that you can physically see. You can now start to take an action plan. And it it may seem a little cliche, but the reality is most people know what it is they need to do to get around the issue. Human beings are incredibly intuitive. Like my role as the, as the well-being therapist is just to guide people to understanding that. You know, I, I don't have like any sort of magic to take away the anxiety. I just show them the tools that work for me. And when they do it and when they start to implement it, they see the results. And that's it. You know, you just put down your thought to paper. You can physically see the issues that you're dealing with and then come up with a logical pragmatic action plan and it is you know without trying to sugarcoat the the word anxiety but with regards to dealing with it unless it's unless it's a it's a it's something that you need like you know medical help with there there's a simple solution to at least managing the anxiety step 1 which is okay you first need a tool to stop yourself from tipping over the edge. Once you've done that, step two is you can then go back to it and physically see the issue by writing everything down. And then step three would be to just create an action plan to take yourself away from that space. Brilliant. Great, great tips, Shravan. Thank you so much. Um, I mean, speaking about breath work, I talk about it a lot. It's something that really helps manage my anxiety. And, and I think the word there is manage, like because nothing's actually going to get rid of it, but learning how to manage every day is so different. So you could have a great morning and then a bad evening, but it's just having those tools. And I think what I love about breath work is it's free. You know, it's something you're able to control and you can do it anywhere. Um, so I think it's a really, really great technique, um, you know, especially lots of children doing their GCSEs now, like there's lots of anxiety levels are really high. Um, I, something I really love is you said you've got sort of four year olds and teenagers coming to you. So are you seeing like a change in that, like more men, more young boys coming for sort of like the well-being side? Yeah. So the, the, the thing is, right, with a lot of guys, they're at a position in their lives where they've... They don't have answers before, you know, even before the older generations, the, the term just man up was an acceptable answer. You know, oh, uh, I feel stressed. Well, just man up. We don't, we don't talk about problems. We don't do that here. And that was, that was just accepted. But because with, because now with, uh, with, with the current state of society moving outward and, and thinking about, well, that's not really cutting it anymore we need to figure out a way to actually help you know not just not just achieve the outcome of say manning up but we also need to look at the process of what it takes to man up if that makes sense and um and a lot of guys would think about that and they say well I, yeah I, I don't actually have a tool like i don't have a toolbox to deal with the issue in front of me you know how can i sort of, you know, how can I repair the circuit board if I don't have the toolbox with the spanner, you know, if I don't have the wrench, et cetera. And so the boys that come to me are looking for the tools to, yeah. to bring harmony to their lives. And so I'm seeing an increase in that for sure. Definitely seeing an increase in that. Um, with regards to how it's all, like how effective it is, 
this is another thing. It's solely down to the individual, right? You can uh, you can take a horse to water, but you can't make a drink. Absolutely. Whoever whoever stays consistent will start to develop. You know, consistency builds proficiency. They will start to feel the benefits of the breath work more the more that they do it. But then it's also about creating the habits and then sticking to that. And this isn't just a men problem. This is a people problem. Human beings are very resilient to change. And in some cases, I see that it's almost like it serves the individual to, to sort of go back into the bad habits because it brings about a sense of comfort to them. And specifically with men, we've become so comfortable with not talking about our problems because this is it. Um, this, this is like one point that I'd really want to make with, with regards to raising the awareness about men's mental health. Because I've realized a lot of people say, okay, men just need to talk more. I've realized it's not as simple as that. Because from, from generation to generation, the reasons why a lot of guys don't talk about their problems, and even myself have had issues with being you know, forthcoming with just opening up about how I'm feeling, is because from a, from a very like intrinsic point of view, men see emotions as a form of vulnerability. Which is true in essence, because if you're telling someone, I don't like the way you say this because this is how it makes me feel, we're showcasing that you know it it's it's affecting us to a certain point. And because of that, the vulnerability then can be perceived as weakness. And 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 men, you know, the 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 archetypal masculine energy is meant to be a strong, solid, rooted, grounded energy so showing weakness is not you know or perceived weakness is not something that would normally fall in line with that with that stereotype that's just the way that a lot of men think it's also because even myself going back on my own experiences i've realized that i don't want to be perceived as a burden and by talking about how i'm feeling or that this is stressing me out when i can see that so many people around me are already dealing with so much on their plates right because i i'm also raised by a single mom so a lot of the time when i i'd see you know my mom dealing with whatever it was she had to deal with immediately at that time i thought well you know what the fact that i don't know th this kid called me uh, a bad name or whatever at at school can wait because mom's worrying about like working a, a second job or a third job or you know she's got clients from from eight till six so that becomes like irrelevant and then i just deal with it in my own way right but then the issue with that is when it's not checked it builds up internally and then what happens with a lot of men is they they get to the point like especially the a lot of the guys who come to me for the first time in the first two sessions there's always some form of breakdown or outburst because they've they've built so much pressure up inside them and they've bottled it up and bottled it up and stuffed it down to the point where there's there's no more room there's there's no more emotional real estate and everything just explodes and so that's when a lot of guys can see that because they deal with it themselves and I think this is this is kind of the beauty of it in a sense, which is when you have like male friend groups together from a peer to peer from peer to peer perspective. If we sense that something is bothering someone, we'll say, "Hey, man, is, is everything okay?" And if they don't want to talk about it, we don't push because we also understand, you know, yeah. it's like the unspoken rule: you do not push someone, you do not push them to the uh, to the tipping point if. They want to talk, they will talk. If not, that's fine. You know, the we had the chance to open up and and lend the ear, but if they don't want to talk, that's fine. And yeah. that's that's just how it will be, and we will sit with that. So there's also that reality that we we have to deal with. But in terms of men talking up more and 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 being being a bit more open with their feelings, I think the more male bonding groups that we have the better but you see how it's such a like interlinked issue because a lot of men especially the younger men who live chronically online are, are looking to role models that i would say aren't exactly the healthiest and so their perception of 
masculinity, their perception of what it means to talk about issues is very, very skewed. And they're looking at things through a very one dimensional lens. So you're dealing with the already pre existing issue of men who don't talk enough to then trying to find the right kind of male friends to open up to. Yeah. But then you're always running that risk. And yeah. that's also another human thing. You know, yeah. you, you could you could open up to another like a female, for example, and then be completely ridiculed for speaking about how you feel. So with regards to men specifically, they're that much more cautious because they also don't want to be seen as weak by other men because that guy potentially is the competitor. He might get the job. He might get the girl over me. And if I tell him about something that I'm insecure about, he could weaponize that against me. Yeah. So we need, we need more, we need more men to be more receptive and, and to be, to be honest, I mean, I, you know, I also do Reiki. We need more Reiki healers out there to invite more men. Absolutely. Because when they, when they get on that healing bed, they're in a position where they feel safe enough to open up. And yeah. um, that, that's a big, that's a big thing there. For sure. And I, you know, and like I say, for all the audience listening, you know, Shravan is a Reiki master. He does healing. Uh, one of my next episodes will be with a guy called Sukhpada from Body Sync. He's a holistic healer. Um, so I encourage all those listening, if you're in a, especially the men, if you're surrounded by a group where you feel like you can't be vulnerable and you can't open up, that's where having a well-being therapist like yourself, Shravan, or I see more men going to therapy. I see more men going to well-being retreats, just men only, because they can probably be more open and vulnerable with other men like them. So I think the advice I'd give to a lot of men is just find that third party where you feel safe and you can open up and you don't feel like a burden because there are amazing people like you, Shravan, out there that can help those men open up um and you know heal and so i thank you so much for sharing that and i think it's really really important that we get this message across so we have a closing question shrevan on this podcast so today's episode is called now i know about men's mental health and struggles with today's society so what advice do you think your male clients would tell their younger self now that they know more about anxiety and healing it's an interesting one um actually i i i I had a similar conversation with one client prior to this podcast and the answer he gave me was was very enlightening. It wasn't so so simple as oh yeah, you know, just talk about it. What he did say was, you know, as long as you figure out habits that that serve you in a healthy way to deal with whatever you're going on, that's good enough. It's identifying, it's being able to identify the issue, which is like the superpower. Because so many people don't actually fully identify what the issue is. They know something's wrong, but they don't know what the issue is. And if you can do that, you're already like ahead in that sense. You're already ahead of like falling back into your own, um, into your own trauma cycles. And so I, yeah, I, that that's something that I would say. I think a lot of the the clients that I work with would would agree to as well. They'd say as long as you can identify it, then it's fine. You don't have to be a hero for anybody else. You just need to like show up for yourself, and then as you do that more in time, you'll be able to show up for other people. That's exactly what I did, to be mm. fair. So absolutely, I think that's it. Yeah. Love that response. Thank you so much. And, and you know, like I say, you're doing some of your amazing things with your clients and keep doing that. And um, so, Shravan, let people know how they can connect with you. Yeah. So you can find me on Instagram at, uh, at Shravan Alopi. I am also on YouTube. Again, Shravan Alopi. Those, those are the main handles that I use. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you, everyone, for um, Shravan. Thank you so much for your time and really speak about men's mental health and all the amazing work you're doing. We just need more and more people like you. I think it's amazing. Um, so thank you for your time. And to the audience, thank you for listening. Thank you. Bye.